Hi, I'm Rich Miller. At Virtua, we believe citizens need to be informed about the important health care issues affecting their lives. That's why we're proud to support health care programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by Virtua, Wells Fargo, Caldwell University, the New Jersey Education Association, Suez, ready for the resource revolution, Johnson & Johnson, and by Kessler Foundation, changing the lives of people with disabilities. Promotional support provided by NJ.com, small news, big news, true Jersey, and by NJ Biz, all business, all New Jersey. This is One on One. I'm an equal American just like you are. The jobs of tomorrow are not the jobs of yesterday. Look at this. You got that? this? Here it is, man. Look at that. Life without dance is boring. <laughs> when you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? Do you enjoy talking politics? No. People call me because they feel nobody's paying attention. Our culture, I don't think, has ever been tested the way it's being tested right now. That's a good question. High five. Welcome to the Tisch WNET studio right here in Lincoln Center. It is our honor to have all the way from Cleveland, Ohio. <laughs> People won't recognize you, you from gotta Cleveland. You got to come from somewhere. Yeah, you, you got to come, come from, from somewhere, somewhere, but now yeah. they recognize you. Michael Simon, chef, restaurateur, and co-host of The Chew on ABC, which is actually right across the street, right? Yeah, absolutely. And author of this book. Do you mind if I plug your book? No, that'd be great. I love a good Michael plug. Simon's Five and Five for Every Season, 165 Quick Dinner, Side, Holiday Dishes, and More. Hey, pretty good. what are you not doing these days? I mean, oh, Man, on. I stay busy. I like to stay busy. We're, uh, you know, my, myself, my wife Liz, and our other partner, Doug Petkovic, we have owner-operate 19 restaurants that we've opened over the past 20 years. Uh, do the chew every day for, you know, on ABC, which is fantastic. And then I still have my Food Network show, Burgers, Brew, and Q. So I, I, I like to go. I don't you really like, do. I don't like to sit still, you when know? you were growing up in Cleveland, by the way, I just asked you, because uh, I always joke about this, people complain about how cold our studio is, and you said you did Letterman back in, no, if not too long yeah, ago, right? Yeah, well, yeah, about 10 years ago now, I guess. His studio, colder than this. <laughs> so cold. <laughs> How cold? So cold, I could see my breath. I would, I could take food out of a pan that was on fire, <laughs> and it was, it, you could freeze it so within seconds. So this is seconds. nice. This is nice. This, this is feels balmy, good. Right? I have balmy. Okay, so balmy. Cleveland. Growing up in Cleveland, yep. you said you go to Browns games. Absolutely. You didn't have the pound. whole dog pound thing. I didn't, right? No, I didn't. I didn't paint my face, but I was in the pound. You know, I used to have tickets in the pound. Now we. You now know, we're, what? You got the, we're, we're slightly older now, so now we have a suite. You got it's, the cash it's much more comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> no, we just do food for the Browns, so they let us oh, have a suite. Oh, that's right. You did a food for that. It's even better. When you were growing up. Was this the dream, or did the no, dream develop? No, no. You know, um, I, I was a, a wrestler growing up, a, a, a pretty good wrestler. Um, in had high a, school and college? High school what? and had a horrific injury in college, law, or in high school. Lost my scholarships to college. Um, you know, my dad worked at Ford Motor Company, so I had to get a job to help pay for school because my scholarships went away, and started working in restaurants. Fell in love with it. Um, what did you love about it? I, you know, I loved the, I, I was never the greatest student, um, but I, the, the, something about the flow of the restaurant business, the, the quickness, the spontaneity, the, the enjoyment people would get after they would eat, all those things was very magic to me. And I just fell in love with the business. And, and I, you know, my father has more degrees in a thermometer. So when I told him, uh, you know, in 1986 that I wanted to go to culinary school, back then there was no Food Network, there was right. no celebrity chef, you know, Julian Jacques, uh, cooked on television, very few others. He he like he wept. I mean that that and wasn't Child's what he wanted. From PBS, yeah, he meant. yeah, back in the day, right? Yeah. It was so, PBS, right, right? PBS. And so it, he was very upset. Took him a long. T he made me go to college. I got like a point eight, and then you know I have a Greek I think mother. That was possible. So I, it's okay. not. It's not go easy ahead, to sorry. do. I'm an overachiever. And yet a Greek mom. I interrupted. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, but a, a Greek mom. So. You know, I said, Mom, I, I just want to go to culinary school. And, and, you know, Greek mothers with their boys, they will do anything that their boys want. So she convinced my dad to let me go to culinary school and went to Culinary Institute of America, and here I am. So here's the thing. On the chew, who's your cast? Uh, myself, old dear friend, Mario Batali, uh, Carla Hall, 
Clinton Kelly and Daphne Oz. So there's five of us. We sit around a table. We cook. We kibitz. We interview people. It's a lot of fun. Not scripted. Unscripted. Totally no. spontaneous. Yeah, totally spontaneous. There's, uh, I mean, there's ins and outs that you can read, but you don't need to. Um, yeah, it's totally, totally spontaneous show. I love it. Did you think to yourself, hey, I'm going to be hosting a network show every day? <laughs> no. Uh, no, 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 never in a million years. How they get I, you? I, I mean, I remember I went to culinary school to be a chef, to be a tradesman, and um, I started doing things on the food in 1998. Food and Wine named me uh, best new chef in America. At, at that time, Food Network was just starting up. They gave me a show. I co-hosted a show called The Melting Pot. Been doing things with Food Network ever since, since 1998. And then one of the people that used to produce a lot of shows on the Food Network, Gordon Elliott, got this show here on ABC. And he asked me if I had any interest to be a co-host of the show. Hmm. Um, came in and read, like Mario and I came in and we read together and we were laughing because we'd <laughs> known each other. What do you mean you read other. together? Well, we, we had known each other for 15 years and they just brought like a bunch of people in and kept putting five at a table to see who meshed. And Mario and I were like, is it me or you or me <laughs> and you? Like, it'd be really fun if we were both here together. And we ended up both getting chosen to do the show. You guys are real friends. Oh yeah, we've been friends forever. Friends forever. So like him and I, knew each other long, long before we did the Chew, but the other three hosts, we all met, you know, the first day of rehearsals. What do you think it is? I mean, the Food Network obviously has blown up. It's, you know, oh. what do you think it is that draws so many people to cooking on television? Well, you and know, is it the cooking or the people and the cooking and the people? What is it? I think it's both. I think, you know, it, it everybody eats, so it definitely hit a chord in America. And, and you know, a long time ago, it was you would just find cooking shows on PBS or, or shows like that. And the, when the, the Food Network came along, and I always say it was the Emerald moment, something magic happened when E Emerald got up Gaza. there and bam, you know. Was it bam? I, that's that. Well, the, the story behind bam is he, when he used to tape, tape the essence of Emerald back in the old Food Network days, we would do five, six, seven shows in a day, one after another live to tape. And the camera guys. Kind of like around here. But yeah. <laughs> the camera guys would fall asleep. So Emerald, to wake like him up, would no, go no, bam, no. <laughs> and like did he say boom to get them wake to get him up? To wake him up, and it became like this big. That's why thing. we have robotics here, right? You're saying that Emerald would go bam to wake up camera people? Yep. You're making that up. I'm not making it up. I'm not making it up. It's uh, he's told the story before. It's a true story because we shared a lot of the same cameramen, so it's a true story. Well, we have the best camera people here at Public Broadcasting. But here's my question to you: When he's doing that. Do you envision that, okay, that's happening, and he's a great personality, right. that it's ever going to be this? No. No, I laugh about it still. It's still comical to me. I mean, I still think of myself as a chef. Really? Know? As a chef? Absolutely. As a chef first. Always a chef first. Not a television personality? No. no. Husband first, then chef, and then I do television. And I've been fortunate enough to, to be on television doing something I really love. What's you know? the meat thing? I, Love me. What's the network? I'm burgers? A, uh, burgers, brew, and brew. Q. You know, and most Q. of our restaurants are very meat-centric. Why? Um, yeah, I'm a Midwestern boy, you know? I mean, you know, uh, my wife's a vegetarian. People in the Midwest think that's a disease. Hold on. <laughs> you know? Are you serious? <laughs> yeah, I swear. Yeah. Your wife's a vegetarian? Yeah. Uh -huh. How does that work out? Hey, it works out great. You know, it's, uh, my son's actually a vegetarian, too. It, it, it's good because it gives me some balance. Because, as Liz likes to say, left to your own vices, you would just live on on steak, smoked brisket, and ribs. You know, you'd, you'd probably make it to 50 if you were right. lucky, right? <laughs> there it is. So like her, uh, with her vegetarian lifestyle, it, it kind of gives me a little bit of balance, which you, is good. Are you looking for the best burgers? That means something to you? Um, yeah, I mean, I think looking for the best anything means best. something to me. You know, I, I love when you go to a restaurant and whether it's something as simple as a burger, um, you know, or as elegant as a restaurant like per se, Right. That the, the people doing it are putting their heart and soul in it to create something that gives you that magical bite. And I think any level of food could do that, from an inexpensive burger to a $300 tasting menu. Talk about this book. This book, this is my second five and five. It's my fourth cookbook, second five and five. Um, and it, it really came up with the, the... What does that mean, five and five? Five ingredients, five minutes, under five bucks. So... The first segment we ever did on The Chew, season one, show one, first segment, was a segment that I came up with called Five and Five, and it became a big hit. And um, the lesson that I learned is, is after 
doing quote unquote fancy food all my life in my restaurants on Iron Chef, all those kind of things. It was really refreshing to me to come up with a concept that like people watched and then they made for their families that night. And that's really what five and five was. It was five simple ingredients, five minutes, five bucks. So you could, you don't have to go get fast food to feed your family or buy some processed, frozen, weird food. You could actually take these fresh ingredients and get a meal on the table in, in quick fashion for not a lot of money. People watching right now, um, someone who says to him or herself, I want to be a chef. <laughs> what do, you, do people ask you all the time? Yeah. Or say, I want to be like you. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, now I think a lot of people want to, like when I ended up on cooking on television, it was by accident. I was good at a, my career and it moved into TV. I think a lot of people now want to learn how to cook to be on TV, which I think is like myself, Bobby Flay, um, Emeril, Mario, Ming Tsai, people like that. We were chefs that ended up on television. As opposed to? Trying to be on television because you could cook stuff. Is and that, I, I don't want to say it's, it's backwards. It's, it's, to me, it's a little bit backwards. Um, I, I would say the people that want to be a chef, I, I, it's like anything else. If, if you're passionate about it, you'll succeed. But, you know, I tell people all the time, I'm, you know, I've been lucky to be relatively successful in this field. And, but, you know, I was last week in Cleveland opening a new restaurant. Yeah, name restaurant. Uh, the new one's called Mabel's Barbecue. Mabel's Barbecue. Yeah, so, th th like, but I worked 18 hours a day for 21 straight uh, days. On your new place? Yeah. Uh, well, how much place. pressure do you feel at your level of success? Put, in general, put that picture up. That's Mabel's. Oh, that's Mabel's, yeah. So, so let me ask you something. With your you, you're ridiculous when you talk about my relative level of success. With your extreme level of success, with Mabel's, how much do you feel... Hey, I'm feeling this. Yeah, I, you know, I always tell people that the people are like, "Do you worried about getting reviewed? Do you worry about the critics? Do you worried about?" And and my response truly always is, no one, no one will put expect more out of our food or my restaurants than me. No one. No one's ex expectations are going to be higher. No one's going to demand more. No one's going to want those things more than I do. So. Yeah. We're always going to put our best foot forward, and then we see what happens. Quick question. Uh, I'm going to ask you about your charities in a second. Uh, as a student of leadership myself, who uh, expects uh, an awful lot of the people around here who are just exceptional leaders, um, and I'm curious, your number one leadership lesson is? Um, I mean, we say it all. You're only as good as your last plate, you know, in, in the restaurant business. It's like... Uh, you know, just because you did one perfect 10 minutes ago doesn't mean you shouldn't do one perfect now. So it, it's, it's I, I, I don't think perfection could ever be attained, um, but it's something that you should always work for. My, my wrestling coach growing up, Howard Ferguson, who was an, an incredible inspiration to me, he, he always said, practice doesn't make perfect, practice makes permanent. Perfect practice makes perfect. And his whole thing is, is you could do something a million times. If you don't do it 100% and you don't do it right, right. it's not going to make you better. If you practice perfectly, that will lead you in the direction of perfection. One more before I let you go. You're committed to uh, certain philanthropic charitable work. Go. Um, Autism Speaks is a big one for me. It's, it's affected people close to me. It's, it's near and dear to my heart. And then there's um, one in Cleveland that we really, really get behind called Urban Community Schools. It's a... Uh, inner city project with inner city kids and uh, special kids that are doing special things. Listen, I want to thank you for joining us. Um, <clears throat> you do great work. Uh, you inspire a lot of people, and you're a great guest to talk to. Thank you. And um, this is the book, Michael Simon's Five and Five for Every Season, 165 Quick Dinners, Side, excuse me, uh, Sides, Holiday Dishes, and More. Thank you for joining us, Michael. Stay right there. Thank you for having me. We'll be right back right after this from the Tish WNET studio here in New York City. To see more one on one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at infocaucusnj.org. At Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD. And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. of it.
it all. That's talent. That's uh, Anna Gasthire. She Thank is an actress. She's a singer. You know her from Saturday Night Live. You saw her right there. That's from Kate. Put out, uh, produced by Connecticut Public Television. Our partner's up there. Um, hey, you, did, when did you know you were so this, this talented? When did you know? I don't think anyone ever knows they're talented, but I, I, knew, uh, I knew I could sing when I was a kid. You know, it's, singing is a weird thing, because if you do it, it's just something that you're kind of born with. I think musical talent in particular, uh, obviously it requires like discipline and, and training and things like that to get it where you want it, but it's definitely the first thing I knew I did better than other people and was something I, you know, was sort of given the gift of. You do have a gift. You grew up, you're telling me you grew up, grew up in actually Washington, D.C. Yeah. Um, when you were there, did you perform in plays? Yeah, I did. My first professional job, believe it or not, was with the Washington Opera as a kid. I was a child chorister in La Boheme and then the child ghost in Verity's Macbeth. Um, and I, of course, performed just in high school plays and middle school plays and all played that. Played the violin. Played the violin, yeah, for about 15 years, actually. Um, not happily, but I did play. <laughs> <laughs> uh, under duress, I guess, as most um, child musicians do. But I, it got me um, into music, and it mm. obviously taught me a tremendous about, amount about theory and pitch and things like that. Mm. And then I went off to, you know, Interlochen National Music Camp and as a violinist, and then I sort of sidled my way into drama because those people were a lot more fun. You are versatile, as they say. Tell me about the Kate. Describe it. Well, so it's an act basically born of everything that I do. Um, you know, people know me I, as a singer. So when I left Saturday Night Live, I sort of followed the old road of my, of my old path, which was that I went off to Northwestern to be a voice major. And when I went uh, to school in Chicago, I fell down the comedy improv rabbit hole because Chicago is the birthplace of improv Second comedy. City. And yeah, and I definitely discovered comedy and found my people and did that and, and really dropped music entirely. I ended up graduating with a drama to, drama degree from Northwestern and then went out to LA and joined the Groundlings and then I got cast on Saturday Night Live and so it was this very circuitous path back to New York and um, music and, and the stage and so I ended up doing um, a couple of Broadway shows, um, several actually, when I left uh, Saturday Night and what happens when you sing places that people ask you to come and perform as a singer but I always felt sort of disingenuous if that makes any sense as myself if I went to sing, people kind of wanted it to be fun and to be funny, and that's really more comfortable for me. Being and, funny. Yeah, to be fun and not to be sort of this gal in an earnest gown leaning against a grand piano. Like, it just didn't feel like, um, I can do it on stage if I'm in a part. I played Alphaba and Wicked for a long time. Very earnest and sincere role in many ways. But um, when it's just me that people are coming to see, I, I tend to have a lot more levity. And so I worked with um, a collaborator, Julian Fleischer. He's a sort of a, he's a downtown jazz uh, singer. He's amazing. Um, producer and we just were good friends and he kept saying like why don't you just sing the stuff that you like the music that you like the music that you play and um, this kind of entertainers era jazz that I live in I call it kind of ridiculous jazz or silly jazz um, it's just such a natural fit for me it's improvisational it's what I listen to at home it's uh, the great singers that inspired me and that's really what the Such act as. is uh, well, you mean Ella and, and Sarah Vaughn and Betty Hutton and I mean, uh, Danny Kaye, kind of ridiculous. Put There's it all a ridiculous. Out there. Yeah, just having a, an enter, entertainment as, as a whole, not just as a vocalist or, you know, mm. a storyteller's ability, which, is, which really existed more when you would go to like a supper club or a nightclub and sit down and have an evening of music, you know. Um, and that's where the act came from. And so it's been around now that we released the album a year and a half ago, and the act supports that. And public television recorded it, and now it's available on Kate TV and at public um, radio stations, public television stations around the country. So, it's so interesting about you, you know. And anyone just Google's you, and again, I use the word verse, so I don't want to overuse it. But it's so amazing to me how your career and you know, all these different things. But I want to ask you a question about. Staying relevant is such a ridiculous way to describe it. Relevance is not a good word. How do you continue to find ways to be creative, have fun, 
make a living, yeah. which last time I checked is still important. Yeah. I know it's a loaded question, but I'm fascinated by that. Because um, so many people don't. Well. Or can't or whatever. Yeah, I mean, I think it depends how you, what, what you're setting out to do. And I which think, is? Um, I mean, I think for me in the case of my record, uh, for, for example, it was less about, it was never really about relevance. In fact, I never assumed anybody particularly wanted to hear it. It's just um, something that I continued to develop kind of privately after I left SNL. I, I do work in film and television, and I was on, you know, I've been lucky that I've had paycheck jobs, a lot of them. Um, and that enables you to kind of pursue what's passionate to you. So you make your sort of New Year's Eve lists, mm -hmm. and you say, what is it that I really want to do, that I want to leave this earth having done? And in many ways, the album was incredibly humbling, because I produced it myself. Um, it was so, I mean, soup to nuts I produced it, you know? I mean, and... and totally hands-on. Yeah, and, and to work with people who I really trusted, musicians who I knew, Julian as an arranger, and then um, to do the music video, to, uh, we, we really like pulled it up from our bootstraps. Yorma Taccone from The Lonely Island from Saturday Night directed it. He's a wonderful director. We called in favors from all of our comedy friends. We shot it in 24 hours. You know, I, we begged, borrowed, and stole and produced it for so little money. There's Samantha B. Um, you know, it, it, it was a real labor of true love. And I think you get kind of spoiled and comfortable when you're at a certain point in sort of the midlife of my career where, you know, I'm used to a show up and somebody provides me lunch and somebody, you know, provides my hair and makeup and, you know, I have someone else is writing the lines a lot of the time. And it was, it really was accidentally incredibly empowering, incredibly challenging, incredibly fun. I mean, you know, and a lucky, and a lucky challenge at that. And I was very aware of that for every second of it. And it really woke me up and reminded me, because that's mm. how my career started. Like, that's how all comics Doing it start. All. You do. Comics have to, you write for yourself. You do you, it all. You hustle. You write your thank you notes and your postcards and your, you know, because every morning you're waking up and mm. thinking, I'm never going to work, you know. But now I know that I more or less know that I'll have a paycheck. I don't always, but I feel safer in that than I used to. It was more just the, the, the kind of peril of, will I ever get this thing done, which is that I... Um, need to take myself more seriously as a vocalist and what's the best possible way to represent that and that's through recording. You know, as, as you talk about your passion for your work, for doing it all, for it being a labor of love, I, 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 I'm reluctant to ask, but I'll ask anyway because, you know, I can. Yeah. And I want to. And we're here. Yeah, we're here. And so, I can say no. I can always say, say I can I always say that. I don't know. Well, you can say I don't want to answer <laughs> it. Um, so, you were talking about when people do things for you and other people write things. Yeah. I don't know who wrote the Alec Baldwin. Oh, the sweaty balls? Well, you know where I'm going. So yeah. um, do you get tired of, and I know no one watching here on public broadcasting, everyone <laughs> would know it, and if you don't, you can Google it. Do you get tired of references to it and people asking about it? No. Which I'm doing again. To <laughs> Saturday Night Live, no, because I wrote for myself the whole time I was there. We were all deeply collaborative. And pitching, because Saturday Night, Saturday Night Live people have come here and said, we have to pitch our idea. You pitch that. Right, it's, it's like the great, la yeah. As you, you write as a performer all the time there. You're engaged in your own output. Um, even if you're not accredited writer on the show, that's what you're engaged in doing. Um, which I guess technically is a dirty little secret, but everybody knows it. So, uh, no, 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 I'm tremendously, I mean, it's, it's all, um, it's ridiculous, and there's tons of things that we can laugh about. I mean, you know, I was singing the national anthem at a at the Do at Dodger Stadium last year, and I, I literally opened my mouth to take a breath, and someone went, "Shwitty balls!" You know, <laughs> no, it didn't happen. yeah. I mean, it did happen. So it, it's definitely the thing that precedes me, and SNL always will because it's such a massive credit, and it's such a game changer as a as a credit. There's just no way to escape that. But I'm super proud of that, and I'm so I I can't believe that I. The older I get, the more I can't believe that I had that opportunity. Um, I think when you're and going, that impact. Yeah. Well, I guess impact. I mean, it's nice to think that I did. But I, I, I'm mostly really proud of my um, female friendships from the show. I'm still so close to my female colleagues in comedy, and um, and I'm yeah. I'm, I mean, it's not an easy workplace, and I grew so much, and I learned so much, and yeah. Can I ask you this as we go into this presidential uh, season? Yeah. Uh, we're in May 2000, and. 16, and they'll show, well, this program will air after that. You, you're Hillary Clinton. Yes. Oh, my impression? Yes. You know, I don't have interesting, I am a Hillary supporter, so I, I um, have thought about this a lot. I, you know, when I, it's so interesting to do her because I sort of did, you know, Hillary 
1.0 because she was she was the first is there a lady. Difference? Definitely. Between then and now? Well, for one thing, when someone is representing sort of the nice wife, it's just there's less to play as a comedian than you would have as somebody who's positing ideas and putting themselves, you know, forward. She was running for Senate in New York at the very end of my tenure at SNL. So I really knew her more as, um, you know, there wasn't much to play except for sort of Daryl Hammond, who, who did this incredible Clinton, Clinton yeah. um, you know, uh, long-suffering sidekick, you know. And, uh, and so it's interesting, like, there's all these variations of her. I mean, she's a very consistent and solid person and, and um, obviously has had huge in intelligence and integrity in everything she's done. But I think that um, there was just less comedy to play there. Uh, so I always feel like it wasn't that interesting of an impression, you know, um, at the end of the day. To do a really good impression of someone, you actually have to sort of find the characteristics that pop out. And she's actually mm -hmm. fairly neutral because she's Midwestern and she's kind of a um, sort of a solid gal in mm -hmm. her uh, demeanor. So there's not as many, like, harsh edges, especially when she was just the first lady. The time we have left. I'm curious about this. Well, what's the biggest thing we saw the Kate there? What is it that you want people to take away from this series? You know, um, it's supposed to just be fun. That's I think fun. I think that that is what the end of the day. Like, yeah, I, I, it was. It's actually really important to me that the, the walk away is not like, wow, I had no idea you could sing. It's as much as, it's really. I want people to make a cocktail and enjoy themselves. Sure. I mean, that's pretty much what I want when I'm live. I want to have the feeling of people going out and escaping a little bit. That's what, that's what comedy's for. That's what you know. That's that's what entertainment is about. I, I, I'm not. I don't think I'm out to educate anybody, or you know, it's just to escape your brain for a minute. And uh, it premieres on WLIW, our, our sister station, right? When is it, folks? May 21st. May 21st. Uh -huh. It's on WLIW, and it's always on the Kate.tv. It's already streaming, so you can check it out there and enjoy it. And if not, that's fine too. And I want to thank you for joining us here on Public Television. Wish you nothing but the best on the Kate, and uh, you are very talented. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. It was fun. I appreciate it. We appreciate it. See you next time, folks. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. This special edition of One on One with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Tisch WNET studios at Lincoln Center. Funding has been provided by Virtua, Wells Fargo, Caldwell University, the New Jersey Education Association, Suez, Johnson & Johnson, and by Kessler Foundation. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Virtua, we don't cut the quad tendon for knee replacement, so you don't have to cut anything you love to do. It's what we don't cut that counts. The Virtua Joint Replacement Institute. Visit gotmylifeback.org today.